can see people joining. Hello and uh, good evening. Um, nice to see you all and welcome to everyone who's joining um, at the moment and I'm just letting people join but uh, in the meantime I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name's um, Eva Leila Pesseran and I'm a college lecturer here at Murray Edwards College and I teach politics and international relations and um, I've been a member of the college teaching those subjects since 2007 and so I know the college really well and I'm really happy to be talking to you this evening about some aspects of international relations that I find particularly interesting and um, I'll probably just get started by bringing up um, my slides straight away. So, as I said, I'm Eva Layla and I teach politics and IR here at Murray Edwards. And I'm here today to talk to you about something that I find really interesting and a really important part of um, international relations and understanding the way that global politics works and is organized in the present day. And that's in relation to imperial legacies. Um, so the, the title of the, of the talk, as you'll have seen when you signed up, is Imperial Legacies and the Hierarchies of International Relations. Um, so I will just get started with my next slide. So um, when we're studying international relations as a sort of a subdiscipline of politics, we're really trying to understand um, the international system and the nature of relations between different actors on an international arena. So we're thinking, uh, a lot of times people think it's just about states relating with other states, and that's a really big part of it. And I think that's a lot of what I'll be talking about today. But it's important to recognize that we're also thinking about all sorts of actors, like anyone who's really interacting with anyone else across borders um, is engaging in international relations of some kind. And um, you know, actors like uh, banks and big, big multinational corporations and, and, um, and, and such like are obviously also engaging in, in international relations, even though they're not states. So that's one kind of example that you can think of um, to give a good sense of, of what that means. Now, if we think about the way that people thought about international relations um, in, in a historical sense, um, and, and sort of traditionally and in a mainstream kind of IR theory, something like a realist theory of international relations uh, it is one of the dominant ones. Um, those theories sort of try to understand and analyze events at a, at a global level um, in a way where they're just saying, well, all states are legally equal and independent. So each country has its own flag and its own bo clear borders and it polices those borders and you know it decides whether you need a visa or not um, as a national of another country to enter and they're all formally independent. And it's not that they don't know and recognize that different states have different amounts of power because obviously they'll that, that would be silly to not even recognize that some countries are richer and stronger or have bigger militaries, for example, than other countries. But in a realist international relations theory perspective, that sort of wouldn't be of, of primary significance and it wouldn't really be the thing that they would be most interested in looking at. They're more interested in thinking about states protecting their own national interests and being in competition with one another um, largely. And I guess the problem that I would see in that is that it can explain a great deal and, and it can be useful um, for certain types of questions that we might, might want to ask about um, international politics, but it doesn't really pay attention to history and to different types of states and the impact of those histories on, on the present day. And so within international relations as a discipline, there's a lot more research being done more recently you know, over the last decade or, or more that really is much more interested in thinking more critically about um, mainstream international relations theories and really importantly looking very historically and I think that one of the things that Cambridge as a university does really well in its study of international relations and of politics generally is that it's it is taking quite a historical look and it's not just abstracting things and making big theories, but really looking at, so what has happened in the world and who has had power and who hasn't and how, how might that have changed over time? Um, and by taking that kind of, of 
perspective on things, we can really start to um, ask deeper questions about the types of inequalities and hierarchies that we might see in the world that has existed over the last um, 80 years or so since the end of the Second World War. When we're talking about hierarchies, we're really just thinking of anything, a hierarchy is any kind of relationship that's like very in a pyramid type structure where you have a smaller number of very more influential and powerful actors. And then many, there are larger numbers of, of weaker um, actors along, along the bottom, right? So it's just any, any sort of structure like that would be a hierarchy. We're thinking of how power is organized and relations are organized in a hierarchical fashion. Um, in the international arena. Um, so I said I was like interested in thinking about things historically. Um, so I'm starting with uh, a picture uh, of, of the world and how, how politically, you know, sort of geopolitically, how the world kind of looked um, on the eve of the First World War. So you can see that the map of the world is mostly, most of it is, is is colored in, in a small number of different colors. And there's a key, we don't need to worry too much, but you know, there's um, the, the, the country, which country, which color sort of um, connects to. So if we look at the top, there's this pinky color and that, that's showing the territory that's um, controlled by Great Britain and other key um, colonial powers at that time who also own you know, control quite a lot of the territory of the world at this time are France, Spain, Portugal, um, the Netherlands and Belgium would be the, the top European powers. And so you can see that th there's a lot of the world in 1914 that's pink. So Great Britain has control over all of these territories in North America, Africa and Asia, as well as like Britain itself. And there's not a lot of variation, right? There's not lots of different countries all with their own, own controlling themselves. So we have a lot of parts of the world, which means that these people who are colored pink, the people living in those territories are being controlled by a colonial power and do not have um, sovereignty um, of, of, the, of themselves. So there's not, not any national self-determination at this point. And we can see that that's the case for the British territories and then also um, for the French territories, which are that kind of that dark blue. Um, if you're interested where it's gray, that's really um, showing where um, th that's, you've got South America and Latin America um, and um, like China. And so you've got non-colonized countries, I guess there. Um, but then you see it's the, look, the map looks so very different just a hundred years after that 1914 map. So by the time we get to 2014 and the map of the world, would basically it looks the same today in 2024, um, is where each country, each, each of these territories that we call a country is, is ruling itself um, and has its own flag and its own um, government, its own coinage, currency, um, and so on and so forth. So it just looks very different. There are many, many more countries um, in the world today than there were in 1914. And it's kind of, it, it, you know, we might think, wow, the world's totally, totally different. And I guess when I'm talking about colonial legacies in relation to these hierarchies, um, I'm interested in thinking a bit about the ways in which, even though on the map, the maps look different from each other, you know, how, how does, the power relations look similar as they actually did in, in 1914 and in what areas have things changed? So I'm kind of interested in us thinking together about continuity and change, um, which also just saying, thinking about these things together, uh, I just want to mention in case anyone does have questions that pop into your head um, as you're listening and as I'm running through the different points that, that I'm exploring today, um, I just want to reassure you that there will be a chance to, to ask questions uh, and, and I'll answer them at the end. So I'm just gonna kind of run through everything and then there'll be plenty of time at the end. So um, you'll be able to put a question into the Q&A and, and I'll do my best uh, to, to answer. Obviously pop that question in whenever it occurs to you, you don't want to forget your question. 
Um, but I, you know, don't don't expect an immediate answer. I'll I'll come to all of those at the end. So yeah, so thinking about that continuity and change together. And as I say, um, I don't think that that world in that map is one where all countries are equal. So they're all equally sovereign. And in terms of, um, you know, in the eyes of the United Nations, the sovereignty or the sort of that independence or autonomy of each country is respected in law. So whereas if we go back to 20, 1914, right, in that world, um, in and when we think like in the lead up to, to this, of the creation of these, these big European empires, um, it was not like, it, there was no law in international law that made it illegal to go and conquer some other piece of territory and then take that on as your own. You know, clearly it, that can't, there can't have been a law, otherwise all of the, the, you know, how would the world have ended up looking like this? Um, you, could, you could acquire territory as a state. But when we come to 2014 and when we come to today, we've got a world where in terms of what international law says, it's not permissible to just say, oh, I like the look of that country over there. I would like to take it because it's got natural resources or it's, I would just like to have um, access to uh, you know, a port or some, some other sort of geostrategic kind of aspect of a piece of territory. That's what the law says. Um, sometimes countries try to you know, just do what they can get, a, get away with. And we obviously have conflict ongoing in, in Ukraine with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which shows it's not like just because something's in law, it doesn't happen, but it's an, it's not a legal thing to do. And that's, I guess, why there's this continuing conflict, right? Um, but so all of those states that we were looking at in the 2014 map are arranged, I would say, in, in this within this hierarchy. And there are these hierarchical relationships, I would say, in three different areas. Um, and so we can see that maybe there are three hierarchies. So one particular country may well sit in a different position relative to some other countries um, when it comes to a material hierarchy. So if we take a country um, like um, Saudi Arabia, it's quite rich, it's a wealthy country. And so it has more money than some other poorer countries, but it might be in terms of a social standing in relation to how it's viewed by the international community and by the dominant powers and, and the, the extent to which international laws that have been developed over long periods of time and that are in practice today, those international laws might not be sort of designed to protect Saudi Arabia specifically. So it might have a different position, but I've kind of jumped ahead. I'm talking about the different hierarchies and different types of inequality without quite explaining them. So I'll just take a step back and we'll just run through these three um, types of inequality that I would like to focus our attention on as we think through the legacies of colonialism and their impact on kind of power structures in the international system as we see them today. So yeah, those three types are material, um, social and legal hierarchies. So uh, with my sort of reference to the Saudi Arabia example, thinking about material wealth, we can we, that gives an impression of, of what that what I really have in mind there. So we've got the kind of the amount of economic wealth, how strong the economy of a country is, how big its military is, which is connected to how much money it has. Because um, if you don't have any money, you can't, don't have any money to spend on on weapons and, and security kind of um, protection. Um, it also affects the sort of the public health capacity and how much welfare a state might be able to provide and its educational provision as well. So that's like one sort of capacity and um, strength that a state might have. It might have different states might have different levels of material um, power, right, and capacity. Then we can think about the social status. So just as perhaps... Um, uh, in other sort of settings where you might think of people having status, having more status than others and having less status, we could take an example like a, like a high school or a sixth form college, right, where there might be a sense that some individuals um, are just viewed with greater respect or uh, get liked by more people um, and then others who are slightly more um, 
less attention is paid to them or that their, their voice doesn't count for so much or they're not quite so influential. So really, when I say social status, it's really not that much different from social status in, in that kind of school, educational sort of so that the social setting of, of that kind of environment. But I'm thinking about it in terms of the state's relationships with one another. So we can think of different states having more sway and influence when um, heads of states and representatives of different countries get together in conferences and meetings. And when we think of things like the G20 or the United Nations itself, um, I mentioned the WTO, that's the World Trade Organization. That's a, many, many hundreds of members, lots of states. Um, the IMF is um, the International Monetary Fund. There are lots of international organizations and there are also regional organizations where different states have representation. And we often see that certain states will, uh, their voice will carry more weight and they'll have more influence. So we can think of there being social hierarchies in the international arena, okay? And then finally, there are legal hierarchies. So we can think of the extent to which different states uh, might either enjoy the protection or not enjoy so much protection of different international laws. International laws might be benefiting certain actors um, relative to others. There's also um, the importance of kind of reflecting on the extent to which actually some states can um, violate things that are considered to be established in international law and get away with it. So there's a hierarchy, you know, it might be one person might be able to get away with breaking the law, um, but it's not so easy for others to do so. So in the same way as we saw, I don't know, in the COVID um, pandemic within this country, we saw that there was a kind of an uneven application of, of laws and regulations in terms of people breaking um, COVID rules or, 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 or obeying them. So we can see that there's, there's a power and a status that some people have where they can kind of um, ignore what the law says. So as I talk through um, my particular examples of thinking about the colonial period and today, we'll be just bearing in mind, we'll be going through these three types of inequality, these three hierarchies, but bearing in mind that they're all kind of intersecting, they're all existing at the same time, and particular states might sit in different locations within those hierarchies and differently for different hierarchies. Hopefully that's all clear. Um, so let's turn first to um, the material hierarchies as they were shaped during the colonial period and then through to today. So the biggest picture there that I can see on the screen is, um, I pre I'll presume it's a familiar image that, that you'll be aware of. What, it's, what that picture is showing is it's reflecting, re representing the, um, the triangle trade of the um, transatlantic slave trade. Um, so we have, um, it's going, the triangle is from like Europe and like West, Western Europe from England down to the West coast of Africa and then over to Brazil and to North America. It doesn't really show the Brazil bit, but to Brazil and to the East coast of America and the Caribbean where, whereby, as you'll all know, um, slaves, you know, human beings were, were captured and taken as slaves from um, West, West Africa and taken over to work on um, coffee and sugar and cocoa plantations um, in the Americas. And then those products were taken back to Europe, to, like, to England. And then with that wealth, England then produced manufactured goods and weapons, which it then sold back um, to Africa and to the Americas. Um, and so we had this very uneven trade. We can very clearly see that there's a material inequality. The human resources of a continent are being stripped away and taken without consent and being made to use to labor, to produce wealth for the European countries. Um, and then they, they make goods and then sell them back and get even more money. Uh, you know, so there's there's this real, real inequality. And when we, you know, oftentimes people think like, why are rich countries rich and then poor countries are poor? And it's really hard to answer that question without paying attention to the slave trade 
and the imperialism and the, like the whole the colonial control of um, Asia, uh, South America, and Africa. Um, you know, without bearing that in mind, because the wealth that was built up, and if we think about an elite institution like the university that I'm working in right now, like the University of Cambridge, there's increasing research and attention being given to the ways that universities such as Cambridge um, built up wealth through involvement of, of, of different people in the slave trade. So then, and then you have lots of property and land and you know, fancy buildings and so on being owned by university institutions. And they, they're, you know, if that's being able to be built up on, on the basis of colonialism and, and, and slavery, um, then, and it's taking the wealth away from the other parts of the world, you know, then once you're rich already, then you can get richer and richer and richer. And so it continues to explain, you know, those divides that we see, that we see now between different countries of the world. Um, so there's the simple way that there's the legacy in that just getting rich at one point helps you get richer. <laughs> and so it carries on. It can't, you know, we can't say that that's not relevant anymore. But I guess the other two pictures on this slide help to sort of point to some of the ways in which not only is it that there's the historical wealth and the historical sort of stealing of wealth um, that's that's just caused to set people on those paths uh, um, uh, of wealth or lack of wealth, but also there are con the thing that's important to recognize is that even with decolonization in the mid um, 20th century, once formerly colonized countries, so if we think of countries, uh, air parts of Africa from which a lot of those slaves were taken, um, like the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, if so you take those three parts of the world that are now sovereign countries, they have independence, they, they're not controlled by colonial powers anymore. But we see that there are lots of other mechanisms that come into play in the ways that um, we, the, the international relations are occurring in I guess specifically I'm thinking of economic relations today as we think about these material inequalities that really entrench even further those historic inequalities. So with the guy with the Nike tick who's uh, asking these uh, workers, and I think some of them look quite young, I, possibly um, child labor there, producing the Nike trainers, um, that's sort of an example of how we, we continue in the West to consume and purchase material products that are made somewhere else where the labor is cheaper. Um, and then that allows us to, to buy lots of products at cheap prices. Um, but in doing that, we're, you know, we're complicit in these, these relations of, um, of, of just exploitation, I suppose, of labor somewhere else. Um, and maintain and, and yeah and is important in maintaining that gap and the other image that we can see that shows an in and an out tray and you've got in coming into the african continent you've got aid and grants so money from wealthier countries being given to, to help support um the economies of various african countries but then the out pile is is much higher the red pile there's many more things and we've got um tax avoidance, um, interest um, on the debt. So if an African uh, country has sought to take out a loan to help it with some financial difficulties that it's facing, it will very likely have requested a loan from the IMF, which was an international financial institution that I mentioned before, the International Monetary Fund. Um, the International Monetary Fund doesn't just give money and say, you know, like, here's a grant, just have it they give loans and those loans then have to be repaid and there's interest that has to be repaid on those loans. And so we find that a lot of, you know, it's so they're poor to, they're poor because of the history of colonialism. Then they try to ask to borrow some money and then they get further into debt. And, um, and that can really rack up really, really quite, quite quickly. Um, and so it, we see that there are things that are being continued to be done day by day that, that really, entrench those hierarchies, right? Those material hierarchies. 
um, between. There's a theory in international relations called world systems theory, and also we some and it links with another theory called dependency theory. So it's kind of a Marxian theory where if you've studied Marx at school at all, um, which to put it really crudely, you know, you've got the, the wealthy class and the wealthy elite, the bourgeoisie, who are rich because they exploit the proletariat, the workers. And what dependency theory or world systems theory sort of do, again, quite crudely, just to get through to some other points that I want to talk about, but we see that they kind of understand the world in the way that as if the, the Western countries are the, the rich bourgeoisie in the scenario, and then they are rich because they're exploiting the, the poorer countries. And so they sort of conceive of the world as being organized into different groups of countries. There are the core countries, which are the wealthy Western countries. And then there are peripheral countries around that, which are the mostly the post-colonial countries. Um, and they're, it's, they're locked into this relationship in a way, <clears throat> or at least for so long as they are locked into that relationship, there's going to be this persistent um, economic inequality, unless you sort of had a revolution or something or broke three of cap three of capitalist um, kind of relationships that are, are creating those those um, those ties of, of exploitation, really. So if you're interested in thinking about it, I would just say go and um, Google and try and find out a bit more about dependency theory, um, which is really interesting. So I'm going to move on, though, now from those material inequalities and material hierarchies to think about social inequalities. So we've got this um, cloud, this word cloud, with sort of civilization there really at the beginning. And this word civilization has been used a lot and done a lot of harm. And we might think we don't really talk about people as being, or whole countries as being civilized as opposed to others that are uncivilized because, oh, we just don't do that anymore. That ended with the end of colonialism. And in a way, I suppose it's less um, acceptable to, to speak in those terms. Although I think that would, we could still find people who do unfortunately. Um, but what we do see is that those ideas, that notion that certain people are better capable of advancing themselves and that there's some sort of reason that the West, you know, that the industrial revolution happened in Western Europe and, um, you know, in England, and that there's something about this idea of having developed earlier and having brought civilization, you know, I don't know, these ideas of the British helping India out by building railroads, um, because that brings civilization. Um, th these sorts of ideas um, were also really important in motivating um, the colonial project in the first place, and then like justifying it afterwards. So you could say there's that goal to, to exploit resources and to gain control of more territories in competition with other European powers, which incentivized a lot of um, and spurred on the colonial project. But there was also a way in which ideas, so we don't just think about material things when we're thinking about politics, there's, there's a power and importance to the ideas that people hold. So we sometimes t talk about that as being thinking about the ideational aspects, which is just a sort of a big fancy word to really be referring to the power of ideas and ideologies. Um, and there were ideas of white supremacy, there were ideas that Christianity was the best religion, that people needed to be, um, you know, converted, and that that would be to their benefit, and they would then be able to become civilized. A lot of that kind of narrative and understanding of the world that was so prevalent during the colonial period hasn't just vanished now that we have had decolonize, formal decolonization um, and the independence for, for um, former colonized countries. We still talk about uh, a con contrast between traditional and more modern countries, or we talk about countries being more advanced or more backward, or even if we think those are un unrespectable kind of terms to be using, people will talk about countries being developed or developing, which does kind of suggest there's some sort of line that, all countries need to go along and get to some point of maybe, I don't know, getting to this dream point of looking like America at the end with an advanced capitalist industrialized economy. Um, 
So these terms, they, those, when we think about development, it's really sitting there in a legacy of these sort of um, standards of civilization that were set upon people um, um, during the colonial period. And so we, we, we really see a lot of that continuing through. And I think the ways that different countries are treated, if countries aren't seen to be developing in the right way, or they don't accept democracy um, in the way that that's the dominant kind of norm, right, of, of the, the, the Western um, kind of community, uh, they tend to get seen as pariah states or they're sanctioned or they're pushed to the side and they're not given much um, influence. So in that sense, we see that social hierarchy that you have the people um, really outcast from what we might consider international community, but then even within those who are part of that international community, there are the states that perceive of themselves as having really created the international structures and the kinds of the, the capitalism and the democracy and the, being the home of those things. And then those who are sort of late comers and just adopting that. So they're seen as further down the hierarchy, even if they're not all the way down the bottom, like the, the, the outcast states might be like, like North Korea, Iran are, are too often um, cited such um, pariah outcast states. So these are the ways in which we can conceive of um, status hierarchies in the present day and their links to imperialism. So my final um, hierarchy that I wanted to talk through, as I said, was the, the legal hierarchies. So, you know, a lot of people think of international law as being very like neutral or it's good, like, oh, well, is that in accordance with international law? or is it not, and it's a very helpful thing, and oftentimes it really is, but what we don't always pay attention to, or we're not always aware of, is how much, like where did that international law come from? Where are its origins? And its origins are really in developing laws to regulate the colonial project, to regulate the competition between the various European powers like Britain and Portugal and Spain and France and Belgium and the Netherlands. It was really to have laws that would apply to those actors in their interactions with each other when they're sort of fighting over what kind of colonial territories they want to um, acquire. So the international legal system that we have today is a product of that colonial period. It grew out of a need to justify and regulate colonization. And so I guess then if you think of that, it's not that surprising that we might find that those laws can be used much more to the benefit of more powerful Western countries than they, than they really do to support the interests and protect the sovereignty of, of weaker states in the international system. Um, one area of like period of history where we really see that, I guess is kind of taking a step back from that post second world war period that I was really, I'm sort of focusing on really, but you can see the tendency towards that. If you look at the interwar period, so that's the period in between the end, like from the end of the First World War and before the beginning of the Second World War. And that was the period when we had the League of Nations. Um, and one of the main things that the League of Nations was really in charge of, other than trying to prevent another world war, which it clearly didn't succeed at doing, um, but it was really to, to um, um, uh, uh, oh, I've forgotten the word I'm trying to think for, but to sort of administer what was called the mandate system. So when the First World War ended, there were a bunch of colonial possessions that had been um, uh, controlled by Germany, which then lost the First World War, and controlled by the Ottoman Empire, which also lost the First World War. So those there were these territories that were no longer controlled, um, by these uh, uh, bigger empires. But at that point in the, you know, well, so the 1919, right, they, the European powers deciding what was going to happen didn't clearly held on still at that point to a lot of these ideas of, of white supremacy and of the, the benefits of colonialism and this idea that only advanced civilized people could be worthy of sovereignty. So you really see this in that interwar period 
where the territories that were no longer being controlled by the Ottomans and the Germans were not considered ready or developed mature enough <clears throat> to just be independent. So it would have been completely absurd at the time to just say, oh, let's allow um, uh, Palestine to govern itself. So no, that became a territory being looked after by Britain as a mandate territory, which was then ultimately like a, the mandate system, as it was called, was this system of having different European powers looking after these territories until they became mature enough to, to gain independence. Um, and it was, it was very hierarchical in itself, different um, mandate territories were given different class, like different kind of category. And then it took, it sort of made it harder and it took longer for the class C territories um, such as Tanzania uh, no, Tanzania was maybe class B, but it was lower down, like relative to Iraq and, and Palestine, which were class A. Um, and for example, Iraq gained independence in 1932, which was relatively early. And then it was much later for some of the other territories, especially um, uh, in Africa, because of the whole, like the racist kind of conceptualization um, that, that framed that system. So our international laws were being used to justify and regulate all of these kinds of things. And even when we think of the UN today, the UN Security Council and the International Criminal Court, which is a UN body, um, these operate in, in very uneven ways. The United Nations Security Council has five permanent members. And who are those five permanent members? They're the, the states that won the Second World War. And so they have a bigger say. So there have recently been votes happening, thinking about various issues. Um, but you know, the, it's the, the, the strength of the UN Security Council and what those five powers want to do that will really shape what sorts of international action is actually taken in response to um, conflict that's ongoing. And so oftentimes those, permanent five members, which are the US, Britain, Russia, China, and France, um, it will reflect like their interests much more than it will reflect any other state's interests. So the legal infrastructure will really protect them. And as we see with the 2003 invasion of Iraq, like I was saying, like sometimes you can just disregard the law if you're more powerful. We, we can see that um, that invasion happened without even the UN Security Council giving its approval. But so some states can get away with doing that. But, you know, if a, a different state were to invade another country, they'd get a very different kind of reaction. Um, so, and the ICC doesn't persecute all um, states, people and leaders of countries who are seen to be um, committing human rights abuses. It in fact has only prosecuted and, and uh, you know, sort of, six, carried through to full prosecution, black African leaders, and that doesn't seem, you know, that's not random, right? So there's there's a problem with the way these institutions work and they have their roots in those colonial legacies. So we've seen, there's a little bit of a pattern going on here in each of the hierarchies, we can see that legacy. Um, but, and there is a really important, but I don't think it's like a, an unimportant, but, or a, oh, but we don't really need to take notice of this. I think just because, we can notice the ways in which a lot of the power structures of world politics are so much influenced by colonialism and by ongoing, like the reproduction of what we could call like neo-imperial kind of policies and neo-imperial relationships between different actors. I think it would be problematic to kind of just paint all of the populations and all of the leaders of the countries of all of these other parts of the world that we might term post-colonial states as victims and to think that they've, they've always just had things done to them. They were colonized, then they were granted their independence. Now they're exploited um, in other ways and now they're just weak. You know, I, I think it's problematic to think that they don't have their own agency and that they haven't ever challenged these hierarchies because I think it's really important to recognize but they've always challenged these hierarchies and they continue to challenge these hierarchies. Um, colonialism itself was challenged. Slavery was challenged. So just some things to look at, you know, the Haitian revolution, 
um, all the way back at the end of the 18th um, century and the beginning of the 19th century, we had colonized enslaved peoples saying no and achieving independence for themselves. So they're not just pawns, they're not just victims. Um, throughout, I mean, I've highlighted the Indian rebellion of 1857, but I think throughout any, any kind of colonial project, the colonized population was always, whether through more subtle heel dragging um, kind of ways or making songs that were uh, mocking of the colonial powers, like any of this, this is all counts as resistance, whether it's from that through to armed rebellion, um, through to peaceful opposition, as we saw in India under Gandhi's leadership, this is all resistance. And, and that resistance doesn't do nothing. And it doesn't, you know, it, we need to see the ways in which that's important in helping to lead to the outcomes that we see. And decolonization happens because people demand decolonization. And then once they um, achieve that independence in the post-colonial period, as, as post-colonial states, we see, and we saw in particular, I mentioned here the Bandung Conference, which was a conference that happened in Bandung in Indonesia in 1955, where lots of leaders of formerly colonized countries came together and tried to build strength in numbers by helping each other out and seeing what kind of things they had in common and how they could resist the um, pressures of the Cold War period of needing to either be part of the US, like the Western Bloc, or the Soviet Eastern Bloc, but they tried to form this non-aligned movement and tried to build strength together. And so, and that that was significant. And I urge you to go and read about that history of the non-aligned movement and the attempt to like construct a new international economic order that would allow them to kind of escape that dependency that I was talking about in, in reference to what the dependency theorists sort of envisage. Um, and OPEC, I don't know if you've all heard of OPEC, but the, the final picture on that slide is of the OPEC sign on the OPEC building. OPEC is the organization of, uh, of the petroleum exporting countries. So it's the countries that are big, big um, oil and gas exporters. So Saudi Arabia, which I mentioned earlier, um, and Iran and Nigeria and Indonesia are members of OPEC. And we see how these countries are all like lower status, lower wealth countries historically. But then in 1960s, when the body was formed, you know, they recognized that they have an enormous potential like leverage point in relation to oil consuming countries like the United Kingdom, the United States. <clears throat> and um, thought, well, if we come together and we kind of decide together, are we gonna all produce lots of oil or shall we all stop producing so much oil? That can give us, we'll get listened to a bit more um, and we can, that can influence the price of oil. And so then we can kind of have a little bit more control over how much wealth we are getting through selling our oil. Um, uh, and so that's just like another example of non-Western agency. And, and oftentimes we see that non-Western agency through collaboration and coming together. So you might be one non-Western state and on your own, you might not be able, be able to do a lot but when you come together. So I think that while there's a lot of that imperial colonial legacy, um, I think it's really important to also pay attention to that resistance to that and the efforts to change. And then we see things developing in the world. Like, I mean, the creation of OPEC happened after the realization that came that was the result of anti-colonial um, activism to gain control of countries in which there was oil in the under the ground, the struggle to actually say, well, we if we have sovereignty as a state, we should also have sovereignty and ownership of our own oil. And that didn't happen until 1960. So all of that time, oil companies could control and own the oil and take all of the, you know, a lot of the profits. Um, and so that's not the case anymore. And if you are uh, a poorer non-Western country and you turn around and discover oil in your ground tomorrow, you are get legally guaranteed that that's yours and um, you will get the wealth from the sale of it. Now, of course, whether the selling of oil and the burning of fossil fuels is something we really want to be encouraging given the climate crisis 
Um, that's a whole other question, but it is an example of, a, of an area in which we've seen concrete gains being made by um, post-colonial um, peripheral states. So I guess that was kind of what I wanted um, to sort of talk through with, with you about, and I can see there have been some questions. Um, so I'm just going to get to those in a second and, and then we can we can talk through this. So I can get a sense then of like what you've been interested in and what you would like um, to know a bit more about or just your own thoughts on anything that I've been talking about. But I have put up here, if you're interested in the kinds of things that I've been talking about today, um, I've put up there some recommendations for further reading and I'll I'll uh, make sure that then you, you can... Um, if you don't do a screen grab or something, take a grab of that right now. Um, I'll make sure that all of you who are here today can then um, get that list sent to you, um, I presume in an email or something, so that you can um, look at those. One of those is an article by me, only because it really is just, um, it's about Iran in the interwar period, um, but it's exactly talking about these three areas, these three hierarchies, um, but then you can see it with, con with reference to one concrete historical case study. So it's a bit more going into depth. So if you were interested in that, you could look at that, but otherwise, um, Franz Fanon, Adam Getachew and Anthony Angi um, have really influenced a lot of, of my own work. So I would actually recommend going to them first. Don't want to plug myself too much. Um, I did have some slides just thinking about, if you like this kind of stuff, come and study Paul and I are at Cambridge. And there are two ways to do that. One is through studying HSPS and one is through studying history and politics. But in the first year, regardless of which um, course you might pick, you would be studying exactly the same stuff. Um, and if you want to know more about that, come to Cambridge um, in July, the 4th and 5th of July, we have open days, come to Murray Edwards and, and, and like find out more. But I'll stop sharing the screen and then I think I'll be able to see your questions more easily, um, which I now can. So I'm just going to, um, so the first question is actually, do I have any book recommendations? So I think I've already answered that. You were, yeah, you asked ahead of time, but yeah, I've preempted that. So hopefully you'll find those. I would start with those. And um, oftentimes when you read one book, you can look at what the references are that that book uses and it, you can kind of snowball and you can find many more things to read. But yes, I would start with those books I mentioned. And yes, yeah, oh, there's just growing, growing numbers of questions. I might, I'm really sorry. Oh, there's so, so many. And I'm not gonna be able, I was starting off trying to go through all of them and I really don't think I'm going to be able to, but it's wonderful that you have so many questions. Um, Oh, here's a good one. Do you have to have studied history to do international relations? Certainly not at Cambridge. We don't expect you to have done um, GCSC or A-level history. I have students who haven't done history at either GCSE or A-level. Um, sometimes if you've done the A-level, it can help because you'll go, oh, yes, actually, I know all about the Cold War or I learned all about the British Empire. But then also sometimes you've studied something completely different or or you've studied something in a way that then we approach it very differently so then it can be almost a disadvantage because you have to unlearn some of the things that you might have been told at school so if you enjoy history and are studying it that's lovely but equally if you haven't but you think that you like thinking about the kinds of things that I've been talking about and you don't mind learning a little bit of history at university then um, politics and IR would be a subject for you to study at university. Um, uh, and I think, so um, the way that I'm talking about the way that, that I'm teaching IR, it's not just at Murray Edwards, it would be at all of Cambridge, the whole, the, the course is really the, the same for, for you, whatever college you're at. And, but then how much is history? I think history just feeds into a lot of it, but it's different from studying history because we might be thinking more about broader, the sort of the questions that we're asking are a little bit different. And we're sometimes thinking about theories and just trying to make sense. So for example, in history, you might study, why did that particular war happen? Or how can we understand what led to one particular war? Whereas when you're studying politics and IR, you might ask a bigger question like, but why does war happen? Why, why don't we have peace? Which is a slightly bigger question. So I guess, but there's some history, you still need to understand some actual wars, you can't just um, make it up, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So 
Um, yeah, quite a few people have asked that. So no, you don't have to have studied history. It's absolutely fine if you haven't studied history. And it's equally absolutely fine if you haven't studied politics um, and you're interested in studying politics at university. Um, it, we really um, have no, um, for HSPS, there's really, there's no required subject. We have students who have done lots of sciences and non-essay based subjects and they come and they do HSPS and they thrive. And um, it really, really doesn't, really doesn't matter at all. Um, but I think it's different. So all of what I'm saying is then different for history and politics. If you want to study history and politics, I reckon I'm the, I'm the politics um, director of studies. So I'm not a total expert on the history side of it, but I do think you have to have done the history to do history. Um, but it's all on the university admissions pages. So if you do want to know 100% and don't just take my word for it, just hop on um, to the relevant page and look at what the, the admissions requirements are for history and politics. But for HSPS, you don't have to have done history or politics or sociology or anything. You can have done absolutely anything at all. But really just go and read and pursue what you're interested in. Um, and that will help you make a strong application to university to just show yourself to be curious and interested in asking these questions. We don't need to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. You certainly can't be expected to have the answers as, as a person applying to university, but having the questions is, is what is really important. Um, so whether you do an EPQ on, you know, on whatever, whether it's politics focused or history focused or literature focused it actually it's just that you've been passionate about something and you've gone and done some research and educated yourself on something and and that show that that curiosity and passion that's what's important and so I hope that um, I've sparked some questions in your mind and some interest to go and find out more about some things that you didn't know about before and if I haven't answered your question because there were ever so many here and it's hard to read them and talk to you at the same time. But if there's a really burning question, um, please just email the admissions office at Murray Edwards and um, they'll send on your question to me and I'll be very happy to um, answer by email. I'm very happy for the slides to be shared with you um, and then you'll have access to those reading recommendations as well. So um, thank you so much for joining and have a good rest of your evening.